Okay. All right, let's get started. Uh, welcome to the ACE Mentor Program of Washington Student Presentation Night. Um, my name is Angela Gatula. I'm the Executive Director for ACE here in uh, Washington State in the Puget Sound area. For 19 years in our area, the ACE Mentor Program has brought together key sectors of the design and construction industry, architecture, engineering, construction management, real estate development, and more to raise the awareness for hundreds of high school students to the possibility of careers in these fields. Since 2001, an estimated 3,000 students have gone through our ACE program. We've awarded more than $764,000 in scholarships, and we plan to award $100,000 to 14 seniors later this month, uh, several of which who are gonna be um, on this call tonight. Um, this year, about 220 students from 64 area high schools participated in our program. Uh, our program consisted of 11 teams, seven in Seattle, two on the east side, and two in the South Sound area. Um, our Puget Sound program ranks among one of the highest in the nation for the number of high schools involved. Oh, I think, go to the next slide, Mark. Um, yeah, we rank among, among one of the highest in the nation for the number of high schools that are involved. Uh, the students are mentored by about 185 of the brightest professionals from 65 of our region's architecture, construction, and engineering firms. So earlier this afternoon, I emailed a program to all of the students and parents, mentors, and registrants of this virtual event. The program lists the names of the students and mentors and outlines a bit more about this year's student project. I'd like to give a special congratulations to this year's outstanding seniors. Um, yeah, you guys uh, <laughs> really rolled with the punches this year. This isn't exactly what we um, we thought would happen. The program also links uh, has links to our Facebook and Instagram pages. Be sure to check those out, like us and follow us if you'd like. So over the course of the year, uh, the teams met, uh, had visited construction sites, learned about each of the disciplines, met bi-monthly at firm offices. The team spent most of the year working on a design project in response to a mock request for proposal that was distributed. All of the students' hard work um, culminates in this evening's presentation. So I wanted to run through the something interesting about this RFP really quickly um, in terms of the project. In years past, the majority of the ACE teams have been given an RFP that was written and created by the local ACE leadership. However, uh, every year there is a national design competition that occurs among all of the ACE affiliates all over the country, 77 affiliates. And this year we gave all 11 ACE teams the option to choose the RFP that was uh, locally generated or the one that was distributed nationally. Interestingly, both of these East Side teams, both of the presentations we'll see tonight, they chose to respond to the national RFP. Local ACE leaders and East Side mentor leaders took the design prompt and they added some more details to re um, really give the East Side students a, a complete design challenge. The project to be showcased tonight is for a Culinary Arts Institute. More information about it is in the program you received earlier today, and we'll learn all about what they came up with a little bit later. Um, of course, we'd like to acknowledge the incredible effort of all the mentors and the students as we worked around school closures and quarantine mandates and we transitioned to a virtual ACE program. Um, all 11 of this year's ACE teams finished their designs and recorded their presentations to be webcast in a series of virtual events this week. Mark, you can go to the next slide. Tonight is the third of five ACE events and we will be celebrating the teams all week. So congratulations to everyone involved, students, mentors, and especially the families for finishing out the year really strong. Thank you, good job. Um, so for this virtual event, we wanted to make it a little bit different. If we, were in, if we were in person, we wouldn't usually have a panel of judges, but we decided to invite a panel of judges to review the presentations and moderate the Q&A tonight. So I'd like to introduce our panel to you. First, Pete Maslenikov is a project executive at Skanska USA Building. Pete currently serves as the vice president on the ACE Board of Directors, and he has been involved with the ACE program for more than a decade, probably longer than either of us can remember. Uh, he's our director of recruitment and he handles um, finding the mentors and assigning mentors to teams. We're really grateful for all Pete brings to our, our uh, program here. Second, Ardell Jala is engineering and technical codes manager with the city of Seattle Department of Construction and Inspections. 
Ardell was involved for many years as an ACE mentor, a mentor leader, and then vice president on our board of directors. She's been away from ACE for a couple of years, so I'd like to think coming to this event tonight feels a bit like visiting an old friend. We're really glad Ardell is with us tonight. Um, and then lastly on our panel, we invited Derek Beeman. He's a senior principal at Magnus and Clemensic Associates. Uh, he was invited as an ACE industry professional. We tried to get three people, someone from the board of directors, a former mentor leader, and someone from the industry. Derek's firm, uh, MKA, is highly involved in the ACE program in, in terms of both leadership and mentoring, but Derek himself has never been to a presentation night like this, and I look forward to hearing his thoughts later on. So thank you, thank you to our three guest panelists for participating tonight. Uh, lastly, I just want to run you through a couple of logistics for, our, for uh, this event. So all attendees should stay muted um, if they're not speaking. The students should notice that their names are already set as their first name, their last name, and their team name in parentheses. And this is important because it will come into play later. There are two types of attendees on our call tonight. There are attendees and then what we call panelists or presenters. Um, so right now, all of the students are designated as presenters and all of um, everyone else is an attendee. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A button. If you are an attendee on the call tonight, you won't be able to use your video, and what you can do is open that Q&A button and you can type in a question at any time. Um, if it's something that you see on the presentation you think is interesting, that you're wondering a little bit more information, we encourage all the attendees to type in a question. Um, and then students whose video is being shown so first it will be the Tuesday team, second will be the Wednesday team. They are still uh, panelists or presenters. They'll be able to respond to those questions in the Q&A box, um, and then they'll be able to show their video and uh, they'll be able to speak when we're in our Q&A session. So there's a little bit of uh, shuffling and back and forth that will happen uh, during our call tonight. So just kind of imagine we've all, we've all shown up to an auditorium and all the students are standing on stage and we're all talking to you right now. So as we begin the first presentation, we'll have all of the Wednesday students sit down because the Tuesday team will show its video. And then when the Wednesday video begins, it's kind of like the Tuesday students will sit down and the Wednesday team will show its video. So just like the shuffling that would happen in real life. Um, our guest judges will moderate the Q&A. They can use the questions in the box or come up with their own, and that will happen after, uh, after each video is finished showing. And lastly, I just want to say please remain for both presentations just so we can support each other and be respectful to everyone who has put in time for this event tonight. Um, okay, well, let's get started. So our first team is going to be the Tuesday uh, Eastside team. Their mentor leader is Adrian Ho with Friedheit Architecture. I'd love to give Adrian a minute just to say something or introduce his group, and then we'll roll with the first video. Um, uh, Mark, do you want us to move the Wednesday students to attendees right now, or should we wait a second? Yeah, let's go ahead and do that right now. Okay. So while Adrian is getting his, uh, pulling his, collecting his thoughts, I'm going to move Wednesday students to attendee mode then they'll be able to see what we've been talking about this whole time. Um, do we have any students stuck in attendee mode right now that should be oh. a panelist for each team? That is a good thought. If any student should be um, is on the Tuesday team and you're in attendee mode, send us a chat or, um, or reach out to Adrian. Let's see. Okay. He and I are doing this together. Um, not really sure what else to say right now, but I'm really proud of my team for putting this together. Um, I know it was a struggle uh, getting everyone on the same page and moving through into a online version of ACE, um, but I'm pretty proud of what we accomplished. Uh, it was definitely hard to communicate, but we got through it. Um, so, well done everyone. Okay. Um, yeah. Thanks, Adrian. Okay, I'm showing that all of the Wednesday students are now attendees, so they should see in their Q&A box, they can ask questions if they'd like, and all the Tuesday students, you guys are on the spot. So, uh, okay, let her roll. Hello, and welcome to, uh -oh. to the 2019-2020 Tuesday Eastside ACE Teams presentation. Uh, my name is Dylan Francisco, and it's my pleasure to introduce our presentation of this year's project. 
Um, each year, ACE teams are divided into specific dis disciplines. So we'll start with architecture as our first um, discipline to talk. So um, as architects, we first wanted to understand what the requirements of our project were. And we found these in our request for proposal, or RFP for short. Um, these include um, spaces that are needed, such as instructional spaces, collaboration spaces, cooking and TV, uh, cooking TV studio, a uh, grill and barbecue space, a dining hall, a uh, retail shop, and um, other support spaces. And after looking at that, we determined what we wanted our space to function as. And through that, we kind of decided and came some goals that we wanted to pursue and achieve in our uh, buildings construction and educating culinary students and the general public on new technology and flavors uh, in the cooking world, promoting collaboration and networking between experts and customers and connecting the waterfront and market um, because of the project's location between uh, Pike's Place and the pier. Um, but as with any project, our, dis our discipline and had to overcome hardships throughout the project's timeline. Um, one of those is COVID-19, um, which uh, led us moving our classes online. And with that came a lot of um, issues with connections and speakers and you know having the motivation to really join a call. Um, and as well as uh, that, we also had some issues, you know, not being on the same page all the time. Um, you know, communication issues and not being able to contact each other uh, much outside of, and as well as, uh, you know, clashing ideals um, from our different ideas of how we wanted our project to look like. Uh, luckily, our discipline and the whole Tuesday East Side team as a whole is uh, just full of uh, willing and flexible students, which helped us work towards solutions to our problems. Um, for COVID-19, we moved our bi-weekly meetings to week meetings in order to achieve more and divided our work based off strength and interest so people would be um, more uh, passionate and more, uh, I would say, more driven uh, to achieve um, the end goal of our project, which is this presentation. Um, and not having a whole team together led us to creating uh, better ways to communicate, such as a group chat and networking more in and inside and outside of meetings to better communicate uh, just um, what we wanted to achieve with our project. Finally, I wanted to take a look at some inspirational photos that helped guide our design philosophy and goals uh, throughout this project. So on the next slide, we have a photo of a lobby in the top left, um, an outdoor dining area on the bottom right, a TV studio on the right side, a test kitchen at the top of the central section, a meeting room in the bottom of the central section, and an image of the exterior of the building, of a building, I'm sorry, in the center. Um, and at, throughout this presentation, you will be able to see how these images reflect our goals and help influence our work. Um, and now to talk more about the location of the site itself, I want to pass it over to Nate. Thanks, Dylan. All right, so for our site, we couldn't really ask for a better location. We are uh, right in the middle of downtown Seattle on the waterfront with an immediate uh, vicinity of Pike's Place Market. So we are really in the center where everything really happens in Seattle. And so zooming in a little bit, uh, looking at the site analysis, you can see that we have a lot of nearby attractions. We have Pike's Place, the aquarium, the Great Wheel, the Showbox, really popular music destination, and the Seattle Art Museum. And thanks to our uh, unique position, we are getting both near constant sun exposure and we're all seeing waterfront views. And then zooming in a little bit more, um, you can see kind of the plan we have for our entire site. So obviously we're gonna have the main building, the actual Gastronomy Institute, but around the building we're gonna have green space where public art can go as in accordance with the uh, RFP. As well as that, um, we are basically moving Alaskan way around our building so we can turn the waterfront into a uh, public space that everyone can enjoy. And to talk about more about the building is Camille with the exterior design. Hey, thank you. So to go over the exterior design, our structure is going to have a brick facade on the exterior. The in inspiration from this coming from the many brick masonry buildings in the Seattle area especially those along the waterfront. We also wanted to create a structure that would fit in and add to the community and act as if it has always been there. 
Next up, talking about interior design is going to be Aaron. Uh, for the interior design, we thought that a uh, more modernistic interior would also separate itself, separate the building from the surrounding buildings, but it would fit in on the exterior. And uh, for navigation within the building, each floor would have a distinct theme or color to identify it, which would help the flow in, in the inside of the building, as well as helping people get to their destination. And next we have Thomas talking about the floor plans. Our first floor includes collaborative and commercial spaces. Most of these are semi-private, only available to those who book them. Our second floor includes educational spaces as well as a public barbecue, and our third floor is dedicated to the restaurant, an entirely public space. Next, we'll have Dylan explain the user flow. Thank you. So user flow is a general term used to describe that people move around the site, and this info is particularly useful for those working on the project to determine where to place attractions within the building and how to best create a more positive experience for those using it. Um, so I have a key in the center of the screen that indicates which group of people are intended to travel in what direction, with black indicating general movement. Okay, so looking at the first floor, which is already shown here, we can see an intended path for delivery coming up the new Alaskan way. Um, three separate entrances with one in the north for employees, one on the east for TV viewers, and one on the south for one else. Um, for TV viewers, they have a chance to enter, obviously, the TV studio to watch their, pro uh, their production, as well as entering the retail area in the lobby when they're done. And as for everyone else, there is a clockwise motion um, indicated the arrows to allow for less congestion by creating a more uniform direction for guests to walk to. Uh, moving along onto the second floor, um, we have created it so that diners will be easily able to access the outdoor barbecue area from the elevators and also have a separate part of the building blocked off for classes. And moving to the third floor, we allow guests from both the market entrance as well as elevators to easily access the restaurants uh, by walking. Um, and next, we are going to move back to Thomas to talk about the first floor. The first floor features a TV studio that expands through two floors, collaborative spaces, and a retail shop. This is meant to be used by TV studio employees and participants, as well as professional chefs. For convenience, we have two vestibules, marked E1 and E2, that Dylan will expand further upon. Thank you, Thomas. So, with our vestibules and entries, we want to create two separate um, entrances, as stated before, for TV viewers and general uh, guests, so that there would be less congestion. Um, the main entrance uh, is open um, to, or I'm sorry, the main entrance opens up to a open lobby space with a concept that allows for attendees to um, just go straight into the building and walk to their attraction. Um, in an open area uh, while holding the amenities of a lobby such as a reception desk and assorted seating uh, to the side, um, which allows for less congestion overall and just promotes a more uh, welcoming feeling to the uh, entrance. Um, and next, Natalie is going to talk about the collaboration spaces and conference rooms found on the first floor. Uh, yeah, so the conference room on the left shows um, a diagram of what it could look like. There are two of these, so both would look really similar. Um, and then the far right conference room picture on the bottom is potential inspiration design for the room. Its only parameter is that it needs to seat at least 12 people. The second picture is a diagram of what the collaboration kitchen could look like. There's no limits on how many people it should seat, but it must be collaborative. So each station would be unlocking wheels to move stations together and apart. And then the top picture is a potential inspiration design for that. Um, the rooms are going to be near each other on the first floor because they're supposed to be working together towards the idea for culinary innovation. And then next is the cooking TV studio. Yeah, so the TV studio is one of the most important spaces on the first floor, and it's one of the largest as well. It goes up two stories um, because we want enough room for the audience and camera equipment to fit in there. It also takes a lot of inspiration from existing TV studios like the MasterChef uh, or other cooking shows. Uh, there's a large filming area uh, with room for 60 audience members as well as filming equipment. Uh, in the back, there's storage, green rooms, dressing rooms, everything that a TV studio needs. Uh, and next, Aaron's going to talk about the retail shop. For the retail shop, it's spe uh, specific for people that want to experiment with culinary or go further into the gastronomy world and pursue it outside of a formal setting. 
Um, our retail shop will provide ingredients and recipes for these customers to experiment on their own at home. Uh, the second photo from the left and the photo in the top right below the map are examples of these starter packs. And next we'll have Thomas talking about the specifics of the second floor. The second floor is a teaching and testing space. Next, we have Nate expanding on the kitchens and barbecue. So on the second floor, as Thomas said, we have uh, the three teaching kitchens that can or situate about 30 students each plus a teacher or two, as well as an outdoor barbecue to continue these culinary ideas uh, really outdoors. So each uh, kitchen is fully equipped with uh, enough workstation to for 30 people, as well as enough sinks, ovens, stoves, fridges and freezers, and other um, necessary appliances that one may need. And in between each of these kitchens is both a uh, food storage space and uh, an additional pantry. And next, Thomas is gonna go over the teaching kitchens, or teaching classes, excuse me. This room is meant to be presentation-based while any hands-on work will take place within the teaching kitchens. There should be a wall television for easy viewing and access as well as casting. Uh, next, we'll talk about the third floor. The third floor is the most public space in the building with a designated kitchen for its restaurant and a connection to Pike Place Market from Festival E4. Next, we have Camille expanding further on these spaces. Hi, so talking about the formal dining room and kitchen over the third floor, to cultivate a the atmosphere of a high-end formal restaurant, the design will be simple and based off of natural materials, such as wood, glass, and steel. Um, and use soft, warm, natural lighting with the windows along the wall between indoor and outdoor dining spaces looking over the Puget Sound. It will also have vaulted glass ceilings over the indoor dining room to allow for lots of natural light as well as greater views of Pacific Northwest sunsets. Next, I will go over the Pike Place Connection. The Pike Place Connection will be a covered walkway between Pike Place Market and our structure. This walkway will be decorated with street art from local artists to show the creative spirits of the city of Seattle and the people who live here. Next up is Alex, who will go over the 3D models. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so here's the final building model. Uh, it's nice to have a 3D model uh, so you can get a sense of scale and really visualize everything that we've talked about so far, like all the balconies and brick facades. Um, and in this next view, um, you can see all the glass that we used um, and all the materials that went into this building. And then on the third and final view, uh, the Pike Place connector, uh, which is really what the project is all about. Uh, it's a way to reinvigorate a previously empty lot in downtown uh, and fill it with something uh, unique. Uh, next, uh, I'll throw it over to the structural team uh, to talk about how our architectural visions stand up, literally. Hi everyone, we are this year's structural engineering team. My name is Noah. I'm Devin. I'm Chloe. Amy, Angie, and Alec were also contributors to this project. However, they weren't able to join us. Foundation systems. Deep foundation is a type of foundation that, is, that uses piles to dig into the ground. The pros of this type of foundation is that it can handle very large design loads, but the cons are that it can be very expensive and may not work depending on the soil beneath it. Spread footing foundation. Um, this is a foundation that is closer to the surface and each consists of a wide bottom portion that spreads the weight of the structure over a greater area and this increases stability. Some pros are that it is the least expensive option and some cons are that footings may sink at different levels which can lead to building damage. Matt foundations. A mat foundation is a reinforced concrete slab which covers the entire area of the building. And some of the pros is that it doesn't really matter what the soil type is underneath it because even if the building sinks, it will sink evenly, which will make so there won't be damage to the building. And however, it may not always be the most cost effective. It's normally the safest option when you don't know the soil, which in our case, we don't have a geological report. So we decided to go with this because if the soil is poor, this will make sure that our building won't have any damage. Um, columns are used to spread the weight out through the building. They are needed that the, to ensure that the building does not collapse. It transfers the weight down to the ground. I made sure to space the columns at a distance that was about as far as it could go without causing the beams to get too large. I placed beams in places that I did not want a column to be 
and were a distance from 20 to 40 feet apart. I put beams over hallways and in the middle of rooms so that there was the least amount of columns as possible getting in the way. As I put in beams, I took out the unneeded columns. I placed shear walls in areas of the building where there would be minimal windows or doors. We also coordinated with the architects and they gave us a few of the walls for the conference rooms as well to become shear walls when the others were going to be windows. And then I tried to balance out the shear walls across the building so that the center of rigidity would be as close as possible to the center of mass. Lateral systems. Moment frames are beams and columns that take on the lateral load in addition to the gravity load. The pros of it are that it allows for windows and doors all over the building. However, it needs bigger beams and is harder to build and it involves the most drift. Brace frames are another form of lateral systems. They can either be X frames or chevron frames. Um, and some pros are that it is cost efficient and there is less drift than the moment frames. Some cons are that it limits the placement and size of the windows. Shear walls. Shear walls are large walls that reach down to the foundation and they help the building resist wind and seismic forces. Some of the pros is they allow for minimal story movement. They're easy to construct. They're also cost efficient. And if the building has staircases or elevator shafts, those can be converted into shear walls. And then some of the cons are you can only have limited doors and windows in them before you compromise the rigidity that they provide. And this is the um, method we're going with because it's cost efficient and the architects wanted concrete floors. So it's very easy to tie them together. Hi, my name is Rosie. I'm Sam. I'm Hayden. And I'm also Sam. So we're the MEP team and our team designs the building systems regarding mechanical, electrical, plumbing, and fire protection systems. So to start off with the building's heating and cooling systems, our team decided to implement variable refrigerant flow systems as the building's heating and cooling system, which is energy efficient and flexible. The system will use heat pumps and gas heating throughout the building to manage heat flow. Our design also includes electric resistance in spaces peripheral to the building to help with heating and utility type spaces. Our ventilation system will be provided through natural ventilation, large seating fans and a dedicated outside air system for fresh air. Our filtration systems will provide the occupants clean air free of dust, germs, pollens, and smells. On the plumbing side of things, we will have water heaters that condense, non-condense, electric, and heat pump. The recircular recirculation systems will be pipings and a pump, and the water reclamation from roof drains will be used in toilets and landscaping. Some fire protection that we'll, we have will be wet pipe fire suppression, which will be used inside, and dry pipe fire suppression, which will be used in outdoor walkways. We will also select different sprinkler heads based on the room that we're in. For alarm systems, we'll, we will have different monitoring systems for sprinkler flow, tampers, or pressure sensors. They'll report alarms, tamper, and trouble signals to the fire alarms and annunciation systems. Some of the LED types that we will have will be different kinds of lighting controls. They're energy efficient, low maintenance, and illuminate for basic functions. Our daylight photocell sensors will reduce luminaire lighting if there's adequate natural daylight. The lighting controls will reduce energy usage, which will be in line with the Seattle Energy Code. So our power will come from underground from Alaskan Way to a transformer, which will make the power usable for our building, then distribute it to switchboards and panels throughout the building, and we will provide breakers to protect loads and systems from damage. And here is what that looks like on a one-line diagram. So based on our loads, on based on our building loads, we figured out that the total load plus 25% spare would be 1,760 amps, and the total service size would be 2,000 amps. For the design of flexibility, we will provide 25% after breakers and capacity and panels have spare empty conduit or pathways to pull new circuits. And we will also provide the ability to easily move equipment without the need to recircuit. 
So amongst our MEP team, we discussed designs for building information and communication technology systems, or ICT systems, which will enable communication cabling and outlets to support telephone and data communication connectivity. Intercom systems will include speakers and interface to the building telephone system to help support partial or zoned or full announcements throughout the building. Audio and video systems with amplifiers, speakers, video projections, and cameras will also be provided in the studio, teaching kitchens, and classrooms to record and present cooking education as a part of the program. In terms of safety and security, the building's fire alarm system, which will include analog addressable detection, such as smoke detection and conveyance system interfaces. Its distributed antenna systems, or DAS, will include infrastructure, uh, antennas and amplifiers, which will retransmit emergency responder radio signals and cellular telephone signals. Security access, access control, intrusion detection systems, and video surveillance systems are to be provided for the building's perimeter entry and interior spaces throughout the building to help safeguard the occupants and contents, particularly in the mechanical room, storage, conference room, and retail space. Now, the main question I know everybody has on their mind is how do we make this sustainable? Well, in terms of electrical, the LED lighting will reduce the amount of electricity use compared to um, more common lighting systems. The building can also have photovoltaic systems, aka solar panels, that all will offset the amount of electricity taken from the power grid. As far as mechanical goes, we can have electro electrodynamic window shading systems that, that will help reduce the amount of light coming into the building, which in turn will reduce the amount of heat that comes into the building, which will make the building a lot more cool during the summertime. We will also have biocomposite-based HVAC units, which will, which will reduce the amount of materials needed to build them because they will be um, built off of reused materials. As far as plumbing goal, as far as plumbing goes, we'll have solar water heating systems that will reduce the amount of energy needed to create hot water. And we'll have rain systems for the, um, low, the fauna on site and gray water systems for the toilets and urinal systems throughout the building. Hi everyone, we're the construction team. My name is Sophia Leota and I will be introducing what construction management is. Martin Shu will be going over our site layout and delivery route. Then Justin Lee will be covering our site safety in the first part of the schedule. Reese Campo will be finishing up the schedule and Michael Kaufman will be explaining the cost estimate. So as members of the construction management team, we were essentially responsible for planning the process that turns all of the designs outlined above into an actual physical gastronomy lab. So you could define construction management as the process of managing components within an infrastructure project. In smaller terms though, you're going to be covering scheduling and how to get things where they need to be on time. Also contracting where you're making connections between different people. Delivery routing is also important to make sure that trucks can get in and out safety planning, since there's going to be a lot of different machinery, and also cost estimating to see how much the building will cost. So as a part of the construction management team, we looked at each of these different components and then applied them to our project, essentially outlining the process that would be required to build this project. So a large part of the construction management team's job is to lay out the job site so it is safe and efficient. So as you can see, the amount of space on the site is very limited, so we arranged everything to make sure the work flows as seamlessly and intuitively as possible. We put down the laydown area, dumpster, and mobile crane, which can be seen in green, orange, and purple, right next to the structure so that materials that are immediately needed can be accessed or disposed of easily. Meanwhile, things like bathrooms, equipment, and material storage and job site trailers are further from the site because they are not as readily needed. The trucks take a route coming in at a right turn from Alaskan Way and out at Pine Street in an efficient way so they can quickly deposit or pick up materials and equipment with minimal traffic interruptions. And of course, flaggers and fences are in place to guide the trucks and ensure the safety of other civilian drivers and pedestrians. Downtown Seattle is very busy, so we wanted to create a delivery route that created minimal disruptions. As you can see on the left map, we decided to have the trucks come off the I-5 and loop around from the south as opposed to from the north 
in order to allow the trucks to make a right turn that avoids cutting across lanes of traffic. When the trucks exit, as seen on the right map, they make a wide loop around to Denny Way. This loop was chosen to make sure that trucks stay on wide public roads where it is easy to maneuver, as well as avoiding busy city centers such as the area near the Space Needle and Pikes Place Market. As you can see on the exit map, it passes between those two landmarks before exiting on the I-5. As the construction team, we also plan for pedestrian safety during the construction of the project. Since the construction site has a bike trail as well as a paved sidewalk next to it, it is imp important to ensure that no pedestrian is accidentally injured. That is why we will be setting up scaffolding along the path of Alaskan Way, as indicated in blue. The picture to the left shows what this path may look like to a pedestrian. The scaffolding will ensure that various debris that may escape the site would not harm anyone. In addition to scaffolding, we will also plan to set flaggers at the entrance and exit of the site, as indicated in red. These will help the material trucks safely enter and exit the site without endangering pedestrians. In addition to planning for sa site safety, the construction team also plans the schedule of the project, which is essentially the project timeline. We attempted to schedule as many activities concurrently as possible in order to expedite the construction process. Here we have the very beginning of the project, which mainly pertains to the more general aspects of construction. These, act these include activities such as site work, as well as setting down the foundation. Uh, the next slide is the main schedule of the building. First schedule we decided to break up four by four until we have three, three fours, and we did this to make sure we can get specific for our scheduling. Uh, in our schedule, we did uh, in order, so we can see each thing how it would end throughout our building. Uh, but some things I wanted to highlight in our schedule is the HVAC. We decided that HVAC would take one of the longest in our building because of the kitchen equipment we had. So we want to make sure plumbing and ventilation would be good. So kitchen smells would be extra the building and should we get enough water. Another thing I want to highlight is electrical. We have both many kitchens for learning and for our five-star restaurant. And we have a TV studio, so electricity was a big component in our building. And one last thing I want to highlight in our schedule is the fire protection and sprinkler system. Due to the multiple kitchens that we have on every single floor, fire protection was a big key component in the sprinkler system, just in case of an emergency. And one last thing is our install of uh, kitchen equipment due to the many kitchens Lots of equipment we have to install and it's special. So that also take up a lot of time in our schedule. And also to make our schedule more efficient, we try to overlap as many things as possible without causing disturbance with other workers. Uh, for our, we also have, we separate our end of our project too. Landscaping, we didn't have much landscaping because our project is built in a very urban area. And so we don't have much room to landscape. So we had a couple of weeks built into our schedule for this. However, we did include bike racks, park benches, and parking lot because we are in a city, so it should be accessible in any possible way. Our parking lot is exterior, so we had to make it look nice, and there's that's so why that took a couple of weeks. We made sure to include cleanup, removing signs, lay down areas, and removal of offices, gates, and bathrooms. So we include that for a couple of weeks to make sure our project was all tidy before it was all finished. Uh, for our total, we had four months of prep work, which includes designing, permitting, and signing off on approvals from the our owner. And then we had 17 months of actual build time. And that was our total project, which is 21 months. For cost estimate, um, some of the things that we have decided to focus on, stuff like decor, because we are expecting people to be coming into this place and to buy stuff, as well as our TV studio, which is going to be expected to have people watching that for multiple different events. As for TV studio, we're expecting to deal with a lot more electrical equipment due to special wiring need to help with, rec with the recording, as well as the environment in the TV studio. One of the huge costs that we have to worry about, which involves the gas, electrical, and HVAC, HVAC and fire suppression systems, is the kitchen due to us having multiple kitchens throughout the building. One of the things, masonry is one of the things we focus on, mainly using bricks due to us wanting to make it look more of a high-end restaurant or high-end place that people want to come and check out. Landscaping, as mentioned earlier, is pretty cheap due to it being already an urban area, so we don't have much to worry about. Integrated automation is considered zero because it's, we are considering a part of the electrical budget instead. As for the safety and security, we have 
focus on those a little bit more. Electronic safety stickers specifically due to us expecting to have people coming in. So we have to make sure the people inside are, are safe as well as not potentially doing anything malicious. So due to our budgeting, we have went about three million over budget and this is our total. In conclusion, this has been the Tuesday Eastside ACE team and our gastronomy lab. We played off Pike Place and really connecting our building and user experience to Seattle culture with being on the waterfront, right near the aquarium, and also right behind Pike's Place Market. My name is Natalie Munson, and on behalf of myself and everyone here, we'd like to thank all of the mentors, students, and parents who made this project come to life. The architectural, structural, mechanical, and construction team specifically wants to thank Freyhart Architecture and Adrian Ho for all of your help this year. Thank you all for watching. Stay safe and have a great day. Okay, great job to the Tuesday Eastside team. I'm going to invite the panelists to ask a couple of questions and um, then the Tuesday team can respond. So Angela, I have a question here. This is Pete. Um, so I, I know that, uh, you know, the COVID-19 separation created a pretty big challenge for your team. Can somebody, can someone give some specific examples on what was the largest challenge you think that that presented to your team and how, how it was tough to, to, to go through the design process um, via Zoom or over the internet? Um, I can speak about that. Um, I'm not sure. Is this thing working? Can you guys hear me? Okay. We can hear you. Yeah. We can hear you. Great. Cool. Uh, my name is Dylan Francisco. I was part of the architecture team. Um, and I'd say if I'm going to be very blunt and honest, the biggest challenge that we probably faced as a team was just trying to get motivated to get out the door and really get this done. Um, obviously there's a lot of, you know, things factoring into it, such as being a high school student and juggling, you know, high school, with uh, ACE as well. But I think uh, COVID-19 really just uh, put a, I think everything stopped so suddenly that we weren't really prepared and weren't really uh, in the right mindset to continue in a space that wasn't the ACE, uh, you know, the normal ACE workspace. So there was a lot of, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of trouble for uh, us to really just uh, get our feet back moving and pick ourselves back up from where we started. And, but once, once we were really, uh, you know, meeting weekly and really, you know, having these conversations, these tough conversations and doing the work, um, I think all the teams kind of banded together and really uh, finished out strong. And so uh, that's what I just uh, feel like would be, would have, would honestly be the hardest thing that we faced as a team. This is Ardell. I just want to say congratulations on a really excellent job on, on this project. Um, that's a really adaptive skill set that you all uh, demonstrated to, uh, to be able to achieve and pull this, pull this project together. Um, we do have a couple questions that are in the Q&A, and so I did want to pose those to the team. The first one's from um, Connor Doherty from the Wednesday team. And the question is, was that tower in the 3D model a sightseeing feature? All right, I can go ahead and answer this one. Uh, I was the, the student who made the 3D model. Um, I'm not sure if there's a way to uh, pull it up at all, um, but if not, um, the tower that was in the question was most likely the place connection. Um, and that's a walkway that we had that actually connects to an existing path to the Pike Place Market. Um, and that one, uh, the walkway to the Pike Place Market didn't get modeled, uh, just the part that uh, would have to be built. Uh, so that's why it looks like it kind of cuts off there. A follow-up to that, was that, RF, uh, was that bridge part of the RFP or was that something that your team felt was important to? Uh, it's not. Uh, it's something that we, that we found uh, when we were looking at the site and we noticed that there was a pathway that was already there that just kind of stopped and didn't go all the way down. And so we decided to incorporate it uh, into the building. Nice job with that. Great, I'll jump in. This is Derek Beeman. Uh, I would like to echo Ardell's comments uh, just on a very thoughtful design and a, and a job well done. Uh, one of the other questions that came in was uh, 
kudos on being only $2 million over budget. And so the question is, how hard was it through the design process to stay within the budget parameters outlined in the RFP? Yeah, first of all, thank you. And yes, it was very difficult since this is such a big project with three floors and so much equipment. And our reasoning through figuring out the budget was essentially just prioritizing what we know needed to have the most money put towards. So electricity was a big one, security, things that you would really prioritize in this type of building to make sure that inhabitants are safe and secure and able to use the equipment to the best of their ability. I'd like to know, um, we know that, the, that there were a lot of challenges working virtually like this um, in getting together and coordinating and um, making sure you have a coordinated design. But given putting that aside, what do you think was the toughest challenge that the design team had to work through um, to make your design work? And I'll give an example of whether it's coordinating your electrical with your, your architectural or mechanical with your electrical. Um, was there a specific challenge that was really tough for your design team to coordinate and um, figure out to, to get to your final design? Um, hi, I'm Nate, and one of the part of the part of the design team. And honestly, the hardest or the most difficult part for us was actually right in the beginning when we were starting the whole design process because what ended up happening is over successive meetings people would come back with these really great ideas that we desperately wanted to integrate into the overall project, which led to kind of this mishmash of the building that would try to combine way too many different elements, even though all these ideas were frankly amazing. So it was really refining down the process and deciding what we actually needed, you know, in the RFP, what we liked and stuff we, even though we might've liked it, we didn't need. So, yeah, just refining down the entire building into final structure. Well, Hi, this like is Ardell to, again. Oh, let's go, go ahead. Ardell. No, go ahead, well. Ardell. You go. I was going to pull a question from the Q and A, and this is from Lynn uh, Shrello from the Wednesday Group, and she asks, "How do you plan to move supplies, equipment, and produce through the building?" Yeah, I can take this. Um, my name is Martin, I'm part of the construction team. And so what we had um, during the construction process is what we decided on stuff like what kind of crane we wanted. And so, to, so during the construction process, when we move supplies, we're using a mobile crane um, to use around the building. We chose that because um, the building itself is not like, you know, a skyscraper type. So um, it's, it doesn't need anything especially tall or expensive. And a mobile crane can be, can access most parts of the, um, most parts of the construction site. And additionally, um, elevators inside the building can be used to be uh, to move supplies, um, you know, through the floors. And of course, um, at the back of the building, there are you know access places for supplies for supplies to come in and out. Thanks, Martin. Uh, I I think that the question would also uh, like to know how supplies and produce and equipment would be moved through the building after construction uh, while it's open. Right, so um, there is a service elevator, um, as I said before, that will be able to move things up and down the floor, especially, you know, big pieces of equipment that require, you know, large elevators, like, you know, um, like kitchen, mobile kitchen equipment or uh, ovens and things like that. And um, again, there is a access um, area at the back where people can bring supplies in and out on trucks, I believe. Thank you. Uh, great. This is Derek Beeman again. A question that sort of bridges the gap between the cost estimating process and the structural design. I might have missed it uh, if it was said, um, but for the gravity framing system for the, the floors, for example, uh, I didn't catch if you were thinking it was a concrete floor or a steel floor system, because in the estimate I saw that you were carrying a little bit of cost in both the concrete and the steel section with floors, maybe. 
So can someone from the construction team talk a little bit about how the structure was, was priced from a, a floor framing system standpoint? Okay, I can start this one. So first we essentially took the square footage of the entire building and we did this by floor. So of course there is floor one, floor two, floor three. And from the information we got from the architecture team, we used the quantity, the square footage, and then also found out the unit cost. So these are values we're getting from a manual, a guide, and then we multiplied those together using the unit rate too for how much each of these things cost and then we it may have been a little hard to see but we lumped these into broad categories like division one division two things that it, it wasn't particularly specific but lumping them into these categories for division one for example was general requirements and i think you're asking more about division two in three, which is like concrete, masonry. So we looked at those and we saw which materials the architecture team wanted to use and, and how, how much square footage they're going to use that and then multiply that by the unit rate. Great, thank you for that. Um, maybe just a follow-up question for the structural team. Uh, did you make a decision on the, the floor framing system between concrete and steel? You did talk about the foundation system you selected and the lateral system you selected, but could someone from the structural team maybe just talk a little bit about more about what you felt was appropriate for the floors? I can take this one. I'm Devin from the structural team. And architecture did tell us um, before we went to away from COVID-19 that they would prefer to have concrete floors. So we incorporated that into the structural design. Thanks, Tim. Well, I'd just like to say a couple of things. Um, you know, just about your overall design, I thought it was really well thought of. Um, I really liked the fact that your team seemed to understand the different systems that needed to go in to support the, the kitchen. You talked about the kitchen fire suppression system, for instance. I thought that was really thoughtful. Um, I like the fact that you worked in sustainability into your design, um, looking at the photovoltaic panels, um, you know, solar water heating, some of those, some of those things that oftentimes get set aside in buildings because they're a little more expensive. And then lastly, um, I really liked that you were pretty honest about your budget and that you went over budget by three million dollars. Um, oftentimes, you know, working in, con in construction, sometimes we have to deliver bad news to owners and they don't like to hear it. And it's easy, the easy path out on teams like this would be to say we met our budget, but the tougher part is to deliver bad news to say we have, we have a project that is over budget and now we have to figure out how to solve that. So um, I'd like to congratulate your team for, for all of those things. I think you guys did a wonderful job. And this is Ardell. I, I want to echo Pete. I, great job, everybody. A um, couple things that stood out to me were your, again, attention to the MEP and the fire protection systems, um, as well as meeting Seattle Energy Code. I do work for SDCI, and I know how uh, tough it is to meet those requirements. Um, one other, one last question that I wanted to ask the construction folks is that um, how did the schedule align with opening of the waterfront and other uh, construction work that was happening down along the waterfront? Yeah, um, so uh, we decided to make sure that um, this, we did take a lot of factors into account, like making it as, you know, not un un unobtrusive as possible. So um, in terms of the, of the water from, we decided to, you know, just work around using hours that, you know, are, are less busy. And we also decided to put in like, as shown in the presentation, we decided to put in scaffolding um, and just to make scaffold, especially since there's a trail there, um, we decided to, you know, spare 
spare no expense in this, trying to ensure the safety and making sure that everything's as efficient as possible and making sure that we can accommodate other um, other projects and other people that are pedestrians that are going through the area. That's definitely important for us. Well, thank you. I, it's, a, it's a complex site and a complex project. So I appreciate all the hard work that you guys put into this. Thanks again. Great. Thanks, everybody. One of the things I really appreciated about the presentation is that you gave a, a little bit of a summary of the options of the different systems uh, that you considered and maybe the pros and cons that went with them and then outlined your, your selected system and why. So I thought that was really well done. Um, one minor comment about the schedule. Uh, you outlined four months for what you called the prep phase, which would include design and permitting. And just maybe a little bit of a lesson learned from being in the industry is that would be probably in the aggressive camp. Uh, there's a lot that has to happen uh, during the design, both within the design team and uh, with reviews with the owner team. And so make sure that uh, when you're doing scheduling in the future, that that uh, critical front end design phase isn't uh, overly aggressive because you won't be able to reach the decisions that you need to reach through that critical phase. So uh, with that said, it, not really a question, just a comment, but you guys did great. Um, and pleasure to be a part of watching your presentation. Okay, I think that we'll do it for the Tuesday team. Nice job, guys. Uh, it was great to watch that presentation. And uh, thanks to, oh, okay, Pete, Pete's doing a little clap, a clap here. So a round of applause. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, uh, I would love to um, take a second. What we're going to do is go into the um, attendee list. And at this moment, it's just going to take a little bit of time. And I am going to be moving the Tuesday students to attendee status. And then I'm going to be moving the Wednesday students uh, up to uh, panelist status so that you'll get a different type of screen. So good job. Everyone was, they were really active in the chat, kind of figuring out the questions. So um, we will, we'll take care of that right now. Okay. Mark, are you ready for that? Okay. So I'm going to move, the, I'm going to move the Tuesdays down and Mark's going to move the Wednesdays up. So everybody hold your, just hold on for uh, just a minute. see how we're doing. Wednesday, Wednesday, Wednesday. Okay, it looks to me like we're ready. Well, I've got all the Tuesday students out to, um, out to uh, attendee mode. Okay. Our Wednesday's up. Um, okay, while we're finishing up, we're almost done with that. I'd like to introduce uh, Steve Larson, who is the mentor leader for the Wednesday Eastside team. Um, Steve, let me give you a, a minute to say something, introduce your team, and then we'll have Mark roll the video. Excellent. Hello, everybody. I'm Steve Larson, the mentor leader for Wednesday Eastside. When COVID changed everything, this team really rose to the occasion. Um, they doubled down, decided to meet every week, mentors and students alike. We had over 90% attendance throughout the entire time. Uh, really made hardship into an opportunity and the skills that we learned about collaboration were just icing on the cake here. It was so much fun for me to watch this group learn and really become good at collaborating on Zoom. I think you're gonna see really great performances from every single one of our students tonight. And I'd like to give a special shout out to Noah Wilson, who edited it and put it all together. So with that, let's roll. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We are Eastside Ace, and this year we were tasked with creating a gustatory establishment in Seattle. The project was supposed to include teaching kitchens, classrooms, a TV studio with all of your favorite shows, and a dining hall, five stars, of course. Um, to name a few. We were given a $35 million budget for the project, 
and 45,000 square feet. Under uh, the fact that the project is located at the corner of Alaskan Way and Pine, which some of you may be familiar with, uh, we'll be going into location next. One of the unique aspects of our project is where our building site is and its surroundings. We are right in the middle of many Seattle attractions demonstrated on the map and photos. On the map on the slide, the site location is circled in red, and several large attractions are circled in black, including the Seattle Aquarium, Pike Place Market, and Gum Wall, among others. These attractions are valuable because we can take advantage of all the people they already draw in, and because of them, the area is already extremely accessible in terms of public transportation. People already love taking photos with the iconic public market center gum wall, so having an exciting building that they would want to show off to would fit right into the area. Also, you can see that we will be right by the water, beautiful views. We'd want to use that to our benefit and showcase that instead of blocking it. Additionally, we'd want visitors to be able to admire the sites inside the building as well, so this would have to be considered in our design concepts, which will be discussed next. Design concepts. We started with around five groups of people creating design options for our overall project, final project this year. The decision was made by both staff and students. They voted separately after the presentations. The selected concept. Of all the designs, the fish won. It got the most votes by the staff and students. The fish design was not just chosen because of its good looks. It was initially going to have windows all over, but we changed that as you'll see in other slides. It was also about the irony of a cooking facility building in Seattle being a fish, or as we later decided, an orca. There are a few challenges that come with building a giant fish. How will the structure work? Where will our vents be? We eventually answered these questions on our own, but it took a hot second. Hi, I'm Onoa, and I'll be talking about bubble drawings. So, a bubble drawing is um, kind of a, a concept that we would use to help um, visualize what our building is going to look like and how it's going to be laid out throughout the project. So at the beginning of the design process we would take a piece of paper and we would kind of try to design all the different rooms to kind of align in a different order. So you can play around with adjacency, how you want um, to visualize it, how you want the rooms to be laid out. So do you want the hallway here, where do you want the bathrooms? and it's especially important in our large facility where all these different things are going to line up. And then, so, since we're using a big fish shape, that makes it challenging to, to draft because there's all these different levels, where is all the stuff going to go? So that's basically what a bubble drawing is. Hi, I'm Cece. I'm going to talk about first floor for our building. So in the first floor, we have a retail room, TV studio, training classroom, teaching kitchen, elevator, and bathrooms. So in the photograph on the right side, which was the entrance, as you walk in, we have the retail room on the right side of the buildings, and next to the retail room was the bathrooms. On the left side of the buildings, we have elevator. As you walk in, we have the training classroom, and we have the teaching kitchen located in the middle of the buildings, and each teaching kitchen has a freezer inside. As you walk, keep walking, um, we have a big elevator between teaching kitchen and TV studio. The purpose of that was easier for transport supplies upstairs and downstairs. Then lastly, we have the TV studio on the back of our building, which was the fish tail. Here we have the floor plan for our second floor. Our second floor is mostly taken up by the two collaboration spaces in the center of our building. Each collaboration space is a larger kitchen that offers more advanced techniques and more chances for more students to have a hands-on experience. Each collaboration space has a shared pantry and individual freezers that will hold all the food that the students need during our studies. Attached to the collaboration spaces on the balcony overlooking the Puget Sound, we have our barbecue area where our students can do some grilling and look at the water and the gardens below. Attached to our balcony, there is a waterfall that falls into the pond below that covers up the supporting beam of our fin to give our building a more streamlined look. To the left, there is the second floor of our TV studio, which expands through to make room for catwalks to allow for set pieces and lights to be hung. 
Next to this, there's the freight elevator that allows for the lights and the food that the collaboration spaces need to be brought up easily. Finally, to the right across from our passenger elevators is our traditional styled training classroom for ordinary classes. So for the third floor, we had to incorporate, of course, the dining hall, but also a teaching kitchen along with the pantry to match that kitchen. Uh, we had to, um, of course, put bathrooms in there along with a bar matching the dining room, which Lynn will go into more detail about that. Um, but the third floor was supposed to uh, capture more light. There's a large glass window facing the Pacific um, to allow for a more pleasant atmosphere. All right, so for the enlarged plan of the TV studio, this studio was designed with the intent of hosting a TV show or hosting people to come watch some sort of live cooking related presentation. Um, we wanted to make sure to include staggered seating so that everybody has a clear view of the stage because the seating is all at one level versus at a slant. The stage itself has a sliding door with a really dramatic backdrop so everyone entering and exiting the stage has a very dramatic way of entering and exiting. The stage itself is equipped with a full kitchen for multiple full kitchens so that if there is some sort of TV show happening each contestant has their own station to work at. The back of the TV studio with the behind the stage has um, a dressing room, a green room, and some storage with its own separate back of house entrance so people who are bringing in anything related to the TV show or anything can put it in the back and they don't have to enter through the main entrance and there is also a public entrance so people entering to come watch the show itself have their own way of entering. The TV studio is actually two stories high so the top level is actually the production area where all the lighting will be hung, cameras, and a production booth so that people can film the shows and it's separate from where everybody else is seating so that it really creates a grand and big awesome studio that people would want to come and watch various presentations. My name is Lynn and I'll be talking about the dining hall. Our reception area is at the bottom right corner of this picture. We have an elevated area by two feet which is marked by the light gray shading. Our mechanical shaft is the square with an X in it. The mechanical team will go over that later. And we also have six different columns to hold the structure up. Next, I will be talking about the interior. We have a bar at the left of this picture and we have booths. We put the booths there to ensure privacy. We also have aquariums. We have an aquarium around the mechanical shaft the end, the five columns. Those are marked with blue. As for seating, we have tables for two, tables for four, and of course the booths. We also put three benches near the reception area. Next is the exterior design. Onto the um, exterior design of the building. Starting from the front is the mouth of the fish, um, which also performs as the entrance. Uh, moving on is the fin of the fish or the balcony with a waterfall underneath. The, bar um, the balcony is a barbecue spot for people to hang out um, on the second floor. Uh, more looking onto the form of the building, the first thing you notice about it is that it curves. It is designed this way so that it can make it more like a fish. Other um, things we've done to characterize the fish are the materials. So the materials we chose for the fish are a mixture of metal and glass, all shaped like triangles. They are shaped like triangles so they can make the curve of the fish. Next, we have another exterior designer by Ian. Hi, I'm Ian from the architecture group and I will be talking about an alternate exterior design. The building would have the same general shape as the original but would have some noticeable differences. Instead of a fish, the building would be painted to look like an orca. The exterior will be all black materials with some distinctive white orca markings. The front will have two large windows. Below will be a pond with natural waterfalls with a northwest appearance. The balcony would be fairly similar with a waterfall underneath it. Around the waterfall will be a park with trees. The balcony will have multiple grow stations and lots of places to relax and so forth. All right, so we are the civil engineering group for the 2020 ACE Eastside team. 
and we deal with everything typically greater than five feet outside of the building. All right, so what you have in front of you is our site plan. This image was provided to us by NearMap, which provides real-time satellite imagery. And the biggest thing you can see here is that the Elliott Bay Trail runs right along the front of our property along the water. And that's a 10-mile trail that runs right through Seattle. So that's really important for our transportation connections, you know, the pedestrian, the bicyclist connections. And then around the back, we've got that truck drop-off. So trucks can drop off all the stuff we need for the Culinary Institute. And then around the northwest corner, we got Pine Street, and that Pine Street allows us to have some parking along the side, especially the disabled parking and access for the apartments next door. All right, so this is our site removal plan. And in this plan, you can see we've got a giant hill in the back. We've got to remove that because that hill is part of our property. And then there's a bunch of curbs around the property that really are not needed or they need to be redone completely. For our utility plan, we have a main water line that goes right down Alaskan Way. And then parallel to that, there's actually a sewage line it's from the old building which has been demolished and that sewage line takes all our waste out the water line will provide us with all our water and then there's a drainage line that goes right out to the ocean takes all the runoff and whatnot right into the ocean and then we have a couple of fire hydrants and power poles which the power poles bring us our power and then the fire hydrants need to be connected for the emergency services finally for our transportation connections um, we are half a mile away from light rail stations and monorail stations and there are no parking minimums because we are in downtown, which means we have minimal parking on the property. Um, Pike Place is also right up the stairs, and then we have a lot of pedestrian connections from Elliott Bay Trail and other trails uh, along the water. And then you can see I've actually included some green striped crossings on there. That actually, the city of Portland found that increased their amount of motorists that yielded to bicyclists by, from 72% to 92%. So it's really important to have some sort of coloration there. And then we've got a couple bike racks on the property. Make sure we have some bike parking. For landscape design, we took a lot of time looking at different books and websites to see what elements we wanted to work into our design. We decided to go with a pond underneath the waterfall from the fin, along with many paths and walkways around the building, along with benches along those paths so people can sit and just enjoy the outdoors, along with a few garden boxes so that students can grow edible plants to use in cooking to be more sustainable. We also have bike racks at both entrances to meet city codes. The plants were chosen by looking at books and websites about Pacific Northwest plants, um, looking for the most sustainable and the most that would work with the, the coastal ecosystem. All of our plants are native and are friendly to this environment that we have by the, by the ocean. And some of them bloom to bring a light color scheme to our um, property. And the amount of green space that we have helps raise our lead score. And the reason why we chose these plants was because A, they look good, and B, they're, they're friendly, they're pretty easy to take care of, and they work well. I will be focusing on the parking lot. The parking lot is on the northeastern side between Pine Street and Alaskan Way. The curved nature of the fish allowed the civil team to experiment with the parking lot design and ended with two parking lots, a small parking lot on the north side for handicapped parking and a large one on the south side for trucks to easily move in and out of the lot. The north entrance has two handicapped parking spots marked in a blue circle and street parking on Pine Street. This was the best position for handicapped spots as they are next to the ent main entrance, the fish mouth, and are accessible to the path that leads to the stormwater pound and fountain. The south entrance on Alaskan Way has the loading bay, three charging stations that are labeled with a green circle, and two parking spots on the edge of the building marked with a black circle. The open design allows trucks to move in and out easily. There is also a five-story parking garage marked with a red box. The parking garage will be the main area for parking for students and visitors. There is also a staircase that connects to Pike's Place Market, which is connected to the orange path. The collage is another way to visualize the area as it mixes multiple aspects of the surrounding area. This helped the civil team understand the area in a new way and conceptualized the area as it changed over time. The surrounding areas played a pivotal role with the placement of the green space and parking lot. 
The green space faces the Pacific Ocean and allows visitors and students to enjoy the area and views that it provides. In contrast, the parking lot is boxed in with a five-story garage and multiple buildings. We used Seattle Gov website to provide the most accurate information in our plan. Hello everyone, welcome to the structural engineering portion of the presentation. And now I will be doing an introduction to structural engineering. So what is it? So structural engineering is basically the skeleton of the building using things like beams, arches, and columns to serve one fundamental purpose, and that is to hold the building up. And there are many factors that play into holding the building up, such as foundations, load considerations, and materials, such as steel, wood, or concrete. And essentially, what we want to do is keep the people safe by grounding the architect's models in reality. Loads are important to structural engineering because you need to know how strong you need to make your floor. So there are two types of loads, lateral and vertical loads. Lateral loads include wind and earthquakes, while vertical loads include live loads and dead loads. Live loads are just people and furniture, stuff that you can move around, while dead loads are immovable objects such as stairs or other immovable objects. Other loads also include rain, snow, soil, and also water. For the first floor, there are a bunch of rooms to look at, but the main rooms here are the teaching kitchen and the lounge. So the teaching kitchen has to be strong because it obviously needs to carry a lot of equipment and lots of people. And the lounge also has to be able to hold lots of people at once. For the second floor, it's mainly the collaboration space and balcony. The collaboration space doesn't need to be as strong because a lot of people won't be gathering there at once while the balcony has to be a little stronger because it has to be able to support itself. And finally, the third floor, the dining room has to be pretty strong because a lot of people will be meeting in there and there will also be lots of equipment in there. After we figured out our loads, we need to figure out on where to put our columns. We use the general guideline of spacing them roughly around 40 feet apart from each other because it's the best compromise between not having columns in the middle of your room and also cost efficiency because if we have long spaces between our columns, those beams and girders are extremely expensive because of how thick they have to be to span those great distances. After that, we organize all our columns into a grid to make it easier for construction and for other parts of this planning to better recognize on where the columns are inside the building. After that, we had to overlay every floor to make sure the columns that we organized on the first floor, lined up, and worked with all three floors. It's especially important in this building since each floor is a little bit smaller than the one before it, so it wouldn't make sense to have a column like just randomly shooting into space where we don't have a floor above it to support. So once we lined up these columns to make sure they worked correctly, we decided to put a lot of columns around that ran right down from the rim of the third floor down to the floor because there's a lot of weight for that domed roof right on that one point. Also, you may notice that we have no columns running along the angled walls on the outside of the building because that's not as strong and it's harder to calculate and wouldn't be as efficient for materials. When deciding on how we would support the building, we imagined placing the columns with girders in a crisscross horizontal fashion to withhold the maximum weight. As you can see in the structure layout, we chose to space our beams 10 feet apart due to the strength of the steel and concrete deck. Since it would be unsightly to have a beam in the middle of the TV studio, we looked along the overarching structures for solution. Finally, we plan to weld and bolt the beam and girders. Since the third floor dome glass roof was a very unique idea presented by the architects, we had to find inspiration in other buildings, such as the Amazon Spheres or the Seattle Library, as you can see on the screen. And on the top left corner, we have our diagram of what the third floor roof would look like with large beams spanning across and making a ribbed steel-like structure to hold the glass. The purpose of foundations is to provide a sturdy base to support the structure. And the structural integrity of the building is closely tied to the stability of these foundations. There are two basic types of foundations, shallow and deep foundations. Shallow foundations are generally used for smaller buildings built on stable soil, while deep foundations are used for larger buildings built on unstable soil and involve piles driven down bedrock. Most buildings along the Seattle waterfront rely on these deep foundations, and our building is located there. In order to determine which type of foundations to use, structural engineers must consult a geological map. 
This map is of downtown Seattle, and geological maps used to show the geologic features of a region, with different types of rock being shown in different colors. According to the map, our site, indicated by the red arrow, is located on a man-made tide flat deposit, which will require deep foundations for a building of this size. Deep foundations are made of steel, concrete, or wood, but our foundations would be made of steel or concrete, which are more common. Installation of these foundations involves driving piles into the ground or drilling a shaft, which is then filled with concrete. In order to create these foundations, structural engineers must consult with a geotechnical engineer, who specializes in the impact of geologic features on a structure. Hello everyone, and welcome to the mechanical and plumbing portion of the presentation. My name is Megan, and I have the honor of working with my amazing team to develop plans for the heating ventilation and cooling systems, or HVAC systems, as well as the plumbing systems required for the building. We chose the VRF system, or otherwise known as the variable refrigerant flow system, uh, because it is 40 to 53 percent more energy efficient than comparable units to it. It does this by heating and cooling at the same time, by taking the heating from the cooling area and bring it to the heating zones, and that's why we chose this unit for our project. And other important systems include like the kitchen exhaust systems, which are made up of many independent parts. Adequate plumbing and sanitation is the best way to protect people from waterborne and waste-related diseases. We are reminded by this pandemic the importance of sanitation and the safe preparation of food under any circumstances. In order to ensure a high standard of sanitation and accommodate many cooking techniques, commercial kitchens involve an exotic array of plumbing fixtures, such as various types of sinks, industrial dishwashers, waste grinders, soda dispensers, and ice machines, to name a few examples. This significantly complicates the design of the kitchens and increases the associated costs as well. To get fresh air flowing inside the building, there were several different pieces of equipment that we designated to place on the rooftop, both the direct outdoor air system, or DOAS unit, and the VRF outdoor unit are responsible for general air conditioning. They keep a controlled and stable internal environment by processes such as heating up or cooling down air. As Mikey described earlier, these systems are energy efficient and will help keep operating costs down. The makeup air unit and exhaust fans are specifically used in kitchens to support the DOAS and VRF systems where there is an increased need for fresh air flow. On this slide, we have created a diagram to represent how each HVAC component connects to different locations within the building. In this one line diagram, you can see how one DOAS unit and one or two VRF units are responsible for the general air conditioning on each floor. There are two VRF units for each the first and second floor due to the larger square footage that needs to be covered. As I stated earlier, the makeup air units help bring air into each kitchen and the exhaust fans cycle air out. Exhaust fans are also connected to the restrooms on each floor in order to keep the air in them clean. This is a diagram of what a VRF system looks like and it has the top condensing unit outside, which typically is on your roof, which then goes down to your distribution boxes, which are in your ceilings typically. Due to the nature of plumbing and HVAC, it is very easy to spread germs across the site. This is potentially harmful to many people. Therefore, there are proper safety precautions taken for those people who are working. This is the one line drawing for the plumbing systems, similar to the one line drawing for the mechanical systems that you saw previously. On the right, you can see a key indicating what each colored line in the diagram represents. Domestic cold and hot water are the lines which carry the potable water, separated into different lines based on their temperatures. There is a sanitary waste line which removes the waste from the building, which does not contain grease, from areas like the bathrooms. As you may be able to guess, the grease waste line removes waste which contains grease, which comes from the kitchens. Finally, there is the gas lines, which provide gas to the various kitchen fixtures. In conclusion, we use an effective and efficient HVAC and plumbing system in order to keep our building running. In addition, we use less water and energy compared to other buildings in order to improve our lead score. This highlights the environmentally friendly systems. Hi, this is the Electrical Group, and we will be presenting the electrical systems for our building. Our group is made up of Tyler Chu, Ian DeVogel, and myself, Jay Deeman. Hello, my name is Ian DeVogel, and today I'm going to be talking to you about some of the electrical systems that's going to be happening with our building. So as you can see here in the first slide, we have uh, what's called a one-line. 
Now the one line basically shows the different rooms and processes that will allow the building to work from an electrical standpoint. Uh, as you can see, we have two main power rooms, one on uh, one side of the building, and we have a second main power room on the other opposite side of the building. Now in order to be most efficient with these systems, we've stacked them on top of each other, one, two, three, for the number of floors, so we have to use the least amount of cabling, and the one line shows that. Additionally, we have some load calculations, which basically calculate the amount of watts per square foot. Uh, this allows us to monitor how much power we actually need to keep the building up and running. Should an emergency happen, uh, some sort of electrical failure and the power goes out, it's important that we have an emergency generator in order to keep all the refrigerated goods and things like that in the building safe. Uh, as you can see here, we have basically a zoomed in view of those electrical rooms that I was talking about in the last slide. You can see the main switchboards and panel boards and all the cabling that will be running throughout the building in order to make sure everything runs smoothly. As you can see, we just have a mini drawing or a sketch of this electrical room. Uh, additionally, we have uh, spiraling cables throughout the whole building in order to make sure everything stays together and working with all the outlets and light switches and things like that. I'm Tyler Chu. I'm going to be talking about the lighting of um, our building. Okay, to begin, if you don't know what an LED means, it's a light emitting diode. This is the most common type of light, and it's going to be the type that we use as well. So um, for most spaces, we're going to just use LED down lights. This includes the lounge areas, the TV studio, the retail, the classrooms, and the main lobby is going to have extra special decorative lighting as well. So it's a little bit more attractive and uh, the TV studio is going to have uh, variable color lighting and a bunch of other adjustable lights as well as flood lights, which um, allows for customization while filming. The second floor has a lot more kitchens, so we're going to have to account for the fact that there's going to be cooking going on. So there's going to release steam, grease and all the other kind of stuff that you don't want in your lights. So uh, we're going to have special waterproof LEDs uh, to keep them safe from any of that kind of stuff. And uh, we're also going to have heat lamps and overhanging lights so that the chefs can see what they're cooking and so that their food stays warm after they're done cooking. The other spaces, the training classrooms, the TV studio, those will also have LEDs just like they did on the first floor. As Tyler just explained, some of our lighting controls are going to have daylight sensors on them. And we chose to do that so that we can meet as many of the requirements off the LEED scorecard as possible. And that's essentially a list of checklist items that we can meet, and that ensures that we get benefits if our building is environmentally friendly. So up in the top left corner there, you can see four of the ones that we plan to meet. So interior lighting, daylighting, those are with the lighting controls there, and the green power. That one is for, it's basically an agreement between the building owner and the power plant producers but that we will only accept power from hydro plants and um, windmills, whatever kind of green energy you want. And we also have green vehicles, so we will make sure that we put green uh, electric charging stations for cars like Teslas or other electric vehicles on our campus so that we can basically promote the use of green energy there. Additionally, our building will incorporate a lot of new technology and we'll also obviously have some of the must-have systems that are called low voltage systems and those include fire alarms, so all the smoke detectors, uh, siren lights and the switches. We have to put electrical systems in for all of those. We'll also have kind of the comfort devices like the Wi-Fi and the Bluetooth technology that you kind of expect people to have in any building. Also, we'll have a lot of security sort of technology, so like the closed circuit TV, that's a big one with the cameras. We want that anywhere, everywhere, especially with um, where we are in Seattle. That's kind of important to have, as well as face recognition technology and access control. So to control who goes, who gets to go and where, face recognition is like an easy way for people who are authorized to go in certain areas to go in those areas, as well as access control, where they can just wave their hand in front of a sensor and it'll let them in. And for any kind of sliding door too that you want for the general public, you can also wave your hand instead of having to kind of push a button for, especially for the disabled doors, which is very nice. So that wraps up electricity. Hi, my name is Brett Munch and I'm from the construction management group on this project. I did the logistics plan for the site. The general location of our project is we're right across the street from the aquarium or where the viaduct used to be. And we're like right next to the sound. So the three main 
logistics plan issues for our site is the west side of our site is a major road, that being Alaskan Way. So we had to deal with this by avoiding any kind of left turns. So we have a right turn enter and a right turn exit that will be flagged at all times that construction is going on to avoid any kind of safety issues. The next kind of issue we had was choosing a crane type. We decided to go with a mobile crane because it'll cut down on costs and because the building's only three stories high, we won't need any kind of tower crane. The third issue that we're having is dewatering because we have the ocean to our west and the hill with rainwater to our east. We decided to put two baker tanks right on the northwestern side of the site, which is the closest sewer entrance. We put those there as a way to get the water off the site consistently and easily. Hi, my name is Kyle, the project manager for the Three Amigos Construction Company. First, I'd like to talk about our schedule. Our schedule has three huge milestones. The pre-construction phase, the construction exterior phase, and the construction interior phase. I'd like to talk about the red lines. The red lines is our critical path, so we have to get it done on that date, and if it takes longer, then our end date will be pushed back accordingly. Our blue lines mean that if something takes a little bit longer, it takes a little bit less time, we'll be okay. It's built into the schedule and we'll be fine if it goes a little bit longer, a little bit shorter. The overall design or the overall time to build will be 79 weeks. 55 of those weeks will be design. Design phases, designing the building. 24 of those weeks will be actual construction. Out of those 24 weeks, 11 of those will be installing the kitchen equipment. The kitchen equipment is very sensitive equipment, very technical, and it's we must take our time with it because we don't want anything to go wrong and we want it to be nice and smooth and working when it comes to open. Uh, the shingling on the side of the curtain wall is very expensive, very fragile glass that needs to be mounted in a certain way. So we need to take our time with it, we need to install it correctly, and that's probably one of our most expensive things. Our, our lead estimator, Zoe, will talk about more about estimating. Thank you. Hi, my name is Zoe Eigner. I am the lead estimator for our project. The first step we took to getting our estimates was doing a gross area analysis. This is where we measure the building and the site that it is on. Our total area for the site was 68,000 square feet and the building was 66,000 square feet. So here is our estimate summary. By using the measurements that we got from our gross area analysis, we were able to determine the size and quantity of the items. And by using historic references, we were able to get some of our unit prices. With the help of the mechanical and electrical teams, we were able to determine the prices of kitchen equipment and installations, as well as plumbing and electricals. After taking all of the construction aspects, we got a subtotal of $36 million. This would have been great if that was all we had to calculate for our project. But as we do have to include the soft costs, which include permits, insurance, and fees, our total was up to $47 million, which is $12 million over our budget of $35 million. Our next step is to discuss with architects, engineers, and the owners about changes we could make to the design or process of the building. We've already come up with some points, which include leaving one or two of the equipments in a shelled condition, which means we do not build all the equipment in them, and we just leave the walls up. We've also come up with a point of just building the foundation for the aquariums and the dining hall, and leaving them to be built later on. This brings us to the end of our formal presentation, and on behalf of my awesome team, I would like to thank you all for watching and listening. Way to go, Wednesday Eastside team. Uh, what a fantastic design, uh, an orca on the waterfront. I am going to let uh, Ardell and Pete and Derek ask a couple of questions. Go for it, guys. I guess I can go first. Um, again, uh, it's a really neat design. I, I really enjoyed the way that you guys went through the design process and came up with something really unique. Um, and kudos to your entire team to putting together an awesome presentation. I'm, I really enjoyed it. Um, I do have a couple of questions though. Um, 
one of which was so with the the fish design um did you guys take into the into account um you know looking at the construction costs associated with um going with that fish design as opposed to a traditional design of the building and what the uh, what the upcharge to to go with that type of design would be Yeah, give me one second. I need to look up some information. Um, but to throw off the bat for the fish, we did recognize that it was a bit of a ludicrous design and that it would have been more expensive, but we determined that that was something that we were willing to do. And that the budget was not necessarily something that we couldn't look past. Maybe there was a way to ask for a larger budget. We could ask um, the contractor for a larger budget or that there was a way to build it more efficiently, but given the time and um, of course the pandemic, we had to overlook these small errors. Fair, fair enough, you should call it a brave design. <laughs> this is Ardell, uh, congratulations everyone on a job well done. Oh, there was a great pun, more efficiently. <laughs> nice job, guys. Um, so I wanted to ask a question to the, uh, the civil team who commented, and, and I also want to applaud you guys for thinking about accessibility for this site. Um, you, in, you talked about arriving to the site via car and parking uh, in the north lot, but what about people with, um, who are arriving by public transit? And how would they get uh, to the site and into the building and then through the building? To answer that, we, um, because the outside of the building, we have a complete uh, set of sidewalks going all the way around. And nearby, there's the staircase leading from Pike's Place up above, along with bus stops within walking distance and the bike trail. So it's a pretty open access to people walking by. Awesome, thank you. Derek, um, thank you for assembling a very uh, thoughtful presentation. I thought it was really nice to have your individual videos there uh, to show who was speaking. I thought that was a really nice, nice touch. Uh, I'll start with a general question. Uh, during the design process, were there conflicts that came up between the different disciplines, such as between architects and engineers and the construction management team? And if so, uh, what was your process for working through or resolving any of those conflicts that may have surfaced? Um, I can just say from the construction management side that there wasn't a whole lot of conflicts Mainly the conflicts just came down to costs, how much everything would cost, how long it would take. But other than cost and time, I didn't find any conflicts in the construction management. I mean, any conflicts that did arise, we made sure to take care of with good communication. We um, dealt with each other in order to resolve such conflicts. But I think that there were less conflicts between disciplines and more conflicts within disciplines, just making sure that everyone was agreeing on the same aspect of the project that we were dealing with, but those were also resolved and we made sure that we were moving forward. What, what, do you, what would you say that your team's biggest challenge was um, in coordinating the design? This is a really unique design with the, the fish shape. Um, what, what would you say is the toughest challenge of that? Um. From the construction management, the toughest thing is just having architect going wild on their design. We had to kind of tone them down a couple of times. But other than that, I would say the fish shape is interesting, yeah. Uh, coming from the structural group, uh, I would say one of the most challenging parts was uh, because it was such a unique design, uh, it took some time for the architects to finally get the final model out to all the other disciplines. So that kind of put a time constraint on us, but I would say that was the greatest challenge.
So this is Ardell. Can I ask for coordination on these weekly meetings? Would each of the disciplines break out into breakout rooms or and come together at the end of each meeting? Or how, how did you guys work co coordinating that? I don't know if Mark wants to answer that since he did all the coordination. I can answer that. Yeah, we used uh, breakout rooms pretty extensively. So we'd all join together as one big group, do some announcements, ask some questions, and then go into breakout rooms and then um, give people the opportunity to bounce between breakout rooms if needed to ask questions to other disciplines. And adding on to that, we also had access to Bluebeam. So we were able to work collaboratively on things like the final floor plan and laying out columns, for example, for the structural team. Well, again, kudos to all of you for being adaptive and, and learning new skills to, to try and be able to work together in a, in a really difficult time period. Um, one more question to the mechanical group. Was there any um, spe special considerations that you had to do for uh, heating and ventilation in the TV studio? I think I saw some comments on the kitchens, and, um, but nothing on the TV studio. What are your thoughts? As the TV studio is a larger area, um, one large consideration is how to control that area. Um, as there are not, and additionally, there are high, large amounts of occupants in that area. So to accommodate that, we would have to increase the um, uh, air treatment that would go to that specific area. Um, additionally, we would have to consider the noise as well that it may create and ensure that it is low enough as not to interfere with the filming that would occur. Excellent, thank you. I'd like to first maybe just offer a, a, a compliment to the, the team. And I first noticed it with the structural team and then I also noticed it with the electrical team. Uh, you all did a really nice job of thinking about this building as a three-dimensional solution. And the structural team uh, made sure that they were overlaying the different floors to ensure that the columns were stacking. And then the electrical team was vertically stacking the uh, heavy electrical rooms to minimize the, the conduit runs. And so that's a really thoughtful solution. And I wanted to compliment you, you all on that because it's a very easy thing to think about each plan uh, in isolation and not as a three-dimensional solution, and you clearly uh, bridge that gap, so that was well done. I do have a, a little bit of a small question for the civil group. Um, com a comment was made that you were gonna remove the hill uh, on your site, and I was curious if you had given any thought to the impact that that would have to the building on the top of the hill, uh, which I would assume would be the market and what the implications or costs would be uh, associated with the removal of that hill. Ms. Civil, Ella, are you civil? She's still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Um, so we didn't really consider the costs. We thought we were kind of thinking construction would answer it. Um, but we kind of have to remove that small hill because it's mostly just debris and dirt um, from removing the, um, the viaduct that used to be right there. And it just looks really ugly right now. Um, and because there is just a, um, a parking garage right behind where our building is going to be, we figured it wouldn't really impact it very much. So I get another, another comment slash question here. I think that, um, the construction group did, a, I think you did a really good job of your knowledge of the critical path of the schedule, um, did a good job of, of showing us your Gantt chart and developing a, a pretty robust schedule there, and, and I commend you for that. Um, the durations, though, I think seemed a little bit tight 
um, 72 weeks, I think it was overall for design and construction. And I think, I thought I heard you say 24 weeks of construction. I could be, could have misheard that. Um, can someone from the construction group um, address how you came up with those durations and whether we think that that's accurate? Sorry. Oh, we came up with those durations by asking the different groups about how long they would take. Um, and yeah, I think I meant to say 24 weeks or 27 weeks. But um, we just asked them how long they would take and take the average length of the installation trying to get through it quick because normally you pick up momentum near the end of construction. So we were hoping you, we would get it done quicker than, quicker than, um, quicker than, um, than we thought. So this is Ardell. I do want to share um, something that was answered in the Q&A and it was a question that was asked. It's curious that neither of you considered a rooftop garden greenhouse for this type of construction. Was cost a factor or did you assume that once the building was constructed, the occupants would manage that? Uh, the actual issue was the lack of roof. Given the <laughs> shape of the fish, the literally <laughs> <laughs> didn't have a roof to put a garden on at all. Uh, we struggled enough having to put a facade so we could stick rooftop MEP equipment, but trying to stick anything green on top of that would have greatly increased the cost. We also actually have a garden. There's what was that, Ellen? Outside of the um, TV studio end of the fish, there's, a, there's small plant boxes out there for students to grow. Um, edible plants. And, and with the edible plants, was that to serve the, the kitchens to be able to use as, as part of cooking? Yes. Awesome. Thank you. Great. I'd, I'd like to just give another shout out to the structural team. I thought the uh, analysis of the geotechnical conditions in that part of the city was really uh, thoughtfully done. I know you didn't have a geotechnical report prepared for the project, but you went out and found the resources that were available to uh, take your best shot at what the conditions were, um, and then to select a very appropriate foundation system given those geotechnical conditions. So that was uh, really well done. And also uh, kudos to the landscape team for uh, selecting the Hinoki cypress. I think that's just a beautiful tree, and I think it would be a great addition to the landscaping solution. Um, it's just a wonderful tree to have on your site. So nicely done. So I guess I don't have any other questions, but I do have a comment. Uh, you know, you guys took on a very, very challenging design. Um, you went through the design process and you you rolled up your sleeves and you came up with a design concept that was that's tough and you guys all buckled down together in a tough environment and put together a really thoughtful design and um, presented well and showed that you had the knowledge that you learned something throughout the year. You learned um, something about the design process and your different disciplines. And so I commend that. Um, and a couple of examples are, you know, we went a little bit above and beyond um, where you would normally see, uh, you know, a group go is, you know, you, did a little bit of research like like Derek had mentioned about the, the soil conditions or the uh, crosswalks for instance um, like the green crosswalks that that was a, a safer solution than just the regular you know white striped crosswalks I thought that was really nice that you did that um, and then also again with the um, the construction cost estimate we weren't afraid to to develop and, and submit an estimate that was over budget when it's the actual and accurate estimate. And what I really liked was the ideas that came beyond that to try to bring the budget back in line. So looking at different solutions where an owner might be able to make a choice to bring it back within the budget that he has. So um, overall, I, I really enjoyed your guys' presentation. I thought you guys, showed some courage in, in selecting in this design and you guys did a good job. Thank you.
And this is Ardell. Again, I echo everything that Pete said. Congratulations to all of you. Um, I, I appreciate that you all started with, you know, five different designs and that you were able to narrow it down to the, the fish and then that transformed into the orca. Um, sounds like there was a lot of discussion on different options for this group. And I'm sure when the construction team came back and said, we're 12 over and everybody sort of had to put ideas out on the table on what could be cut. Um, nobody cut the, the expensive cladding. Nobody, you know, you, you stayed true to the, to the architectural vision. So um, once again, congratulations, you guys. This was a great presentation. And I'm gonna steal the person in the video that <laughs> in our next presentation that I have to present. Yeah, as I said earlier, uh, this is Derek. A very thoughtful presentation, um, both from how it was produced and the content. Uh, just to pick up on the, the thread of costs that uh, has been mentioned in, in both of the previous comments. Um, if you were to proceed into the how to get this back on budget conversation, uh, which some people would call value engineering, other people would call cost cutting, um, make sure you also bring some ideas forward that don't involve um, not giving the owner their primary program. Uh, that's generally what they're building the building for is their program. And so they're going to be pretty reticent to uh, give up on spaces or to have only shell spaces um, rather than look for cost uh, saving solutions that still give them their program. But other than that, uh, kudos on a really thoughtful um, process and analysis that went into all of those decisions you made. Okay. Hey, thank you to um, Wednesday Eastside team for a great presentation. Thank you to our gel as a judge, Pete, our judge, and Derek. Um, I've really appreciated your comments and moderating our Q&A. Um, yeah, the, the design and the innovation that we got to see tonight was amazing. There's no doubt that the future of the built environment is in really good hands with the students on these teams today. So thank you to the mentors and all the families. Um, I just had one more thing I wanted to mention. While, while there are many mentoring programs designed to give high school students exposure to architecture and engineering, ACE is unique in that it exposes students to the breadth of the entire building industry while providing a hands-on experience through a design project like this. So putting together the program takes a tremendous amount of time and energy and dedication. In fact, we've compiled the numbers and we've learned that we run a $1 million program. It costs a million dollars a year to put this on. But luckily, most of that is donated um, by way of mentors who donate their professional hours, um, our meeting spaces, our presentation venues. Well, this was free for, free for this year, <laughs> minimal cost this year. So yeah, the lion's share of the program is pulled together by volunteers and donated time, but we do incur costs as an organization. We're a 501c3 nonprofit, so if you are interested in making a tax-deductible donation, you can. There's a, a sheet in the program that was emailed earlier today about it. Um, we have corporate donors and we're able to offer this to students for free. We figure it costs about $235 a student, but um, all of that is covered by our donations and anything extra goes into the scholarship account and we give all of that away every year. So um, congratulations again to all the teams. Lastly, I wanna say a big thank you to Mark Kinsman at Mortensen. Many of you on the Wednesday Eastside team know that he's one of our mentor leaders, but he's also a technological guru. And because of him, we have figured out how this all works. He's amazing. So he's been hosting our Zoom meetings all this week for our presentation nights. We've got two more to go. Uh, feel free to jump on tomorrow and Friday, the same, same time, same channel and uh, see some other presentations. But for now, thank you for coming. Have a great night. Feel really proud of yourself. You did a great job tonight. So we'll see you next, next year.